Book Three, Sections Fourteen through Eighteen, of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Three, Sections Fourteen through Eighteen. Section Fourteen. The preceding discussion, by a natural transition, leads to the consideration of royalty, which we admit to be one of the true forms of government. Let us see whether in order to be well governed, a state or country should be under the rule of a king, or under some other form of government, and whether monarchy, although good for some, may not be bad for others. But first we must determine whether there is one species of royalty or many. It is easy to see that there are many, and that the manner of government is not the same in all of them. Of royalty is according to law. 1. The Lacedaemonian is thought to answer best to the true pattern. But there the royal power is not absolute, except when the kings go on an expedition, and then they take the command. Matters of religion are likewise committed to them. The kingly office is in truth a kind of generalship, irresponsible and perpetual. The king has not the power of life and death, except in a specified case, as, for instance, in ancient times he had it when upon a campaign, by right of force. This custom is described in Homer. For Agamemnon is patient when he is attacked in the assembly, but when the army goes out to battle he has the power even of life and death. Does he not say, quote, When I find a man skulking apart from the battle, nothing shall save him from the dogs and vultures, for in my hands is death. End quote. This, then, is one form of royalty, a generalship for life, and of such royalties some are hereditary and others elective. 2. There is another sort of monarchy, not uncommon among the barbarians, which nearly resembles tyranny. But this is both legal and hereditary. For barbarians, being more servile in character than Hellenes, and Asiatics than Europeans, do not rebel against a despotic government. Such royalties have the nature of tyrannies, because the people are by nature slaves. But there is no danger of their being overthrown, for they are hereditary and legal. Wherefore also their guards are such as a king, and not such as a tyrant would employ. That is to say, they are composed of citizens, whereas the guards of tyrants are mercenaries. For kings rule according to law over voluntary subjects, but tyrants over involuntary and the one are guarded by their fellow-citizens, the others are guarded against them. These are two forms of monarchy, and there was a third, three, which existed in ancient Hellas, called an isomnesia, or dictatorship. This may be defined generally as an elective tyranny, which, like the barbarian monarchy, is legal, but differs from it in not being hereditary. Sometimes the office was held for life, sometimes for a term of years, or until certain duties had been performed. For example, the Mytilenaeans elected Pittacus leader against the exiles, who were headed by Antimenides and Alcaeus the poet, and Alcaeus himself shows in one of his banquet odes that they chose Pittacus, tyrant, for he reproaches his fellow citizens for, quote, having made the low-born Pittacus tyrant of the spiritless and ill-fated city, with one voice shouting his praises. End quote. These forms of government have always had the character of tyrannies, because they possess despotic power. But inasmuch as they are elective, and acquiesced in by their subjects, they are kingly. 4. There is a fourth species of kingly rule, that of the heroic times, which was hereditary and legal, and was exercised over willing subjects for the first chiefs were benefactors of the people in arts or arms they either gathered them into a community or procured land for them and thus they became kings of voluntary subjects and their power was inherited by their descendants they took the command in war and presided over the sacrifices except those which required a priest they also decided causes either with or without an oath and when they swore the form of the oath was the stretching out of their sceptre in ancient times their power extended continuously to all things whatsoever, in city and country, as well as in foreign parts. But, at a later date, they relinquished several of these privileges, and others the people took from them, 
until in some states nothing was left to them but the sacrifices, and where they retained more of the reality they had only the right of leadership in war beyond the border. These, then, are the four kinds of royalty. First, the monarchy of the heroic ages. This was exercised over voluntary subjects, but limited to certain functions. The king was a general and a judge, and had the control of religion. The second is that of the barbarians, which is a hereditary despotic government in accordance with law. A third is the power of the so-called Isomnit, or dictator. This is an elective tyranny. The fourth is the Lacedaemonian, which is in fact a generalship, hereditary and perpetual. These four forms differ from one another in the manner in which I have described. 5. There is a fifth form of kingly rule in which one has the disposal of all, just as each nation or each state has the disposal of public matters. This form corresponds to the control of a household. For as household management is the kingly rule of a house, so kingly rule is the household management of a city, or of a nation, or of many nations. Section 15 Of these forms we need only consider two, the Lacedaemonian and the absolute royalty, for most of the others be in a region between them, having less power than the last and more than the first. Thus the inquiry is reduced to two points. First, is it advantageous to the state that there should be a perpetual general, and if so, should the office be confined to one family or open to the citizens in turn? Secondly, is it well that a single man should have the supreme power in all things? The first question falls under the head of laws rather than of constitutions, for a perpetual generalship might equally exist under any form of government, so that this matter may be dismissed for the present. The other kind of royalty is a sort of constitution. This we have now to consider, and briefly to run over the difficulties involved in it. We will begin by inquiring whether it is more advantageous to be ruled by the best man or by the best laws. The advocates of royalty maintain that the laws speak only in general terms and cannot provide for circumstances, and that for any science to abide by written rules is absurd. In Egypt, the physician is allowed to alter his treatment after the fourth day, but if sooner, he takes the risk. Hence, it is clear that a government acting according to written laws is plainly not the best. Yet surely the ruler cannot dispense with the general principle which exists in law. And this is a better ruler, which is free from passion, than that in which it is innate. Whereas the law is passionless, passion must ever sway the heart of man. Yes, it may be replied, but then on the other hand, an individual will be better able to deliberate in particular cases. The best man, then, must legislate, and laws must be passed, but these laws will have no authority when they miss the mark, though in all other cases retaining their authority. But when the law cannot determine a point at all, or not well, should the one best man, or should all decide? According to our present practice, assemblies meet, sit in judgment, deliberate, and decide, and their judgments all relate to individual cases. Now any member of the assembly, taken separately, is certainly inferior to the wise man, but the state is made up of many individuals, and as a feast to which all the guests contribute is better than a banquet furnished by a single man, so a multitude is a better judge of many things than any individual. Again, the many are more incorruptible than the few. They are like the greater quantity of water, which is less easily corrupted than a little. The individual is liable to be overcome by anger or by some other passion, and then his judgment is necessarily perverted. But it is hardly to be supposed that the great number of persons would all get into a passion and go wrong at the same moment. Let us assume that they are the free men, and that they never act in violation of the law, but fill up the gaps which the law is obliged to leave. Or, if such virtue is scarcely attainable by the multitude, we need only suppose that the majority are good men and good citizens, and ask which will be the more incorruptible, the one good ruler or the many who are all good. Will not the many? But, you will say, there may be parties among them, whereas the one man is not divided against himself. To which we may answer that their character is as good as his. If we call the rule of many men, who are all of them good, aristocracy, and the rule of one man, royalty, then aristocracy will be better for states than the royalty, 
whether the government is supported by force or not, provided only that the number of men equal in virtue can be found. The first governments were kingships, probably for this reason, because of old, when cities were small, men of eminent virtue were few. Further, they were made kings because they were benefactors, and benefits can only be bestowed by good men. But when many persons equal in merit arose, no longer enduring the pre-eminence of one, they desired to have a commonwealth, and set up a constitution. The ruling class soon deteriorated, and enriched themselves out of the public treasury. Riches became the path to honour, and so oligarchies naturally grew up. These passed into tyrannies, and tyrannies into democracies, for love of gain in the ruling classes was always tending to diminish their number, and so to strengthen the masses, who, in the end, set upon their masters and established democracies. Since cities have increased in size, no other form of government appears to be any longer even easy to establish. Even supposing the principle to be maintained that kingly power is the best thing for states, how about the family of the king? Are his children to succeed him? And if they are no better than anybody else, that will be mischievous. But, says the lover of royalty, the king, though he might, will not hand on his power to his children. That, however, is hardly to be expected, and is too much to ask of human nature. There is also a difficulty about the force which he is to employ— should a king have guards about him, by whose aid he may be able to coerce the refractory? If not, how will he administer his kingdom? Even if he be the lawful sovereign, who does nothing arbitrarily or contrary to law, still he must have some force wherewith to maintain the law. In the case of a limited monarchy, there is not much difficulty in answering this question. The king must have such force as will be more than a match for one or more individuals, but not so great as that of the people. The ancients observe this principle when they have guards to any one whom they appoint a dictator or tyrant. Thus, when Dionysius asked the Syracusans to allow him guards, somebody advised that they should give him only such a number. Section 16 At this place in the discussion there impends the inquiry respecting the king who acts solely according to his own will. He has now to be considered. The so-called limited monarchy, or kingship according to law, as I have already remarked, is not a distinct form of government, for, under all governments, as, for example, in a democracy or aristocracy, there may be a general holding office for life, and one person is often made supreme over the administration of a state. A magistracy of this kind exists at Epidemnus, and also at Opus, but in the latter city has a more limited power. Now, absolute monarchy, or the arbitrary rule of a sovereign over all the citizens, in a city which consists of equals, is thought by some to be quite contrary to nature. It is argued that those who are by nature equals must have the same natural right and worth, and that for unequals to have an equal share, or for equals to have an uneven share, in the offices of state, is as bad as for different bodily constitutions to have the same food and clothing. Wherefore it is thought to be just that among equals every one be ruled as well as rule, and therefore that all should have their turn. We thus arrive at law, for an order of succession implies law, and the rule of the law, it is argued, is preferable to that of any individual. On the same principle, even if it be better for certain individuals to govern, they should be made only guardians and ministers of the law. For magistrates there must be, this is admitted. But then men say that to give authority to any one man, where all are equal, is unjust. Nay, there may indeed be cases which the law seems unable to determine, but in such cases can a man? Nay, it will be replied, the law trains officers for this express purpose, and appoints them to determine matters which are left undecided by it, to the best of their judgment. Further, it permits them to make any amendment of the existing laws which experience suggests. Therefore, he who bids the law rule may be deemed to bid God and reason alone rule. But he who bids man rule adds an element of the beast, 
for desire is a wild beast, and passion perverts the minds of rulers, even when they are the best of men. The law is reason, unaffected by desire. We are told that a patient should call in a physician. He will not get better if he is doctored out of a book. But the parallel of the arts is clearly not in point, for the physician does nothing contrary to rule from motives of friendship. He only cures a patient and takes a fee, whereas magistrates do many things from spite and partiality. And, indeed, if a man suspected the physician of, of being in league with his enemies to destroy him for a bribe, he would rather have recourse to the book. But certainly physicians, when they are sick, call in other physicians, and training masters, when they are in training, other training masters, as if they could not judge truly about their own case and might be influenced by their feelings. Hence it is evident that in seeking for justice men seek for the mean or neutral, for the law is the mean. Again, customary laws have more weight and relate to more important matters than written laws, and a man may be a safer ruler than the written law, but not safer than the customary law. Again, it is by no means easy for one man to superintend many things. He will have to appoint a number of subordinates, and what difference does it make whether these subordinates always existed or were appointed by him because he needed them? If, as I said before, the good man has a right to rule because he is better, still two good men are better than one. This is the old saying, two going together, and the prayer of Agamemnon, would that I had ten such counsellors. And at this day there are magistrates, for example judges, who have authority to decide some matters which the law is unable to determine since no one doubts that the law would command and decide in the best manner whatever it could. But some things can, and other things cannot, be comprehended under the law, and this is the origin of the nested question whether the best law or the best man should rule. For matters of detail about which men deliberate cannot be included in legislation, nor does anyone deny that the decision of such matters must be left to man, but it is argued that there should be many judges, and not one only. For every ruler who has been trained by the law judges well, and it would surely seem strange that a person should see better with two eyes, or hear better with two ears, or act better with two hands or feet, than many with many. Indeed, it is already the practice of kings to make to themselves many eyes and ears and hands and feet for they make colleagues of those who are the friends of themselves and their governments. They must be friends of the monarch and of his government. If not his friends, they will not do what he wants. But friendship implies likeness and equality, and therefore if he thinks that his friends ought to rule, he must think that those who are equal to himself and like himself ought to rule equally with himself. These are the principal controversies relating to monarchy. Section 17. But may not all this be true in some cases and not in others? For there is by nature both a justice and an advantage appropriate to the rule of a master, another to kingly rule, another to constitutional rule. But there is none naturally appropriate to tyranny, or to any other perverted form of government, for these come into being contrary to nature. Now, to judge at least from what has been said, it is manifest that, where men are alike and equal, it is neither expedient nor just that one man should be lord of all, whether there are laws or whether there are no laws, but he himself is in the place of law. Neither should a good man be lord over good men, nor a bad man over bad, nor, even if he excels in virtue, should he have a right to rule, unless in a particular case at which I have already hinted, and to which I will once more recur. But, first of all, I must determine what natures are suited for government by a king, and what for an aristocracy, and what for a constitutional government. A people who are by nature capable of producing a race superior in the virtue needed for political rule are fitted for kingly government and the people submitting to be ruled as freemen by men whose virtue renders them capable of political command are adapted for an aristocracy. 
while the people who are suited for constitutional freedom are those among whom there naturally exists a warlike multitude able to rule and to obey in turn by a law which gives office to the well-to-do according to their desert but when a whole family or some individual happens to be so pre-eminent in virtue as to surpass all others then it is just that they should be the royal family and supreme over all or that this one citizen should be king of the whole nation for as i said before to give them authority is not only agreeable to that ground of right which the founders of all states whether aristocratical or oligarchical or again democratical are accustomed to put forward for these all recognize the claim of excellence although not the same excellence but accords with the principle already laid down for surely it would not be right to kill or ostracize or exile such a person or require that he should take his turn in being governed the whole is naturally superior to the part and he who has this preeminence is in the relation of a whole to a part but if so the only alternative is that he should have the supreme power and that mankind should obey him not in turn but always these are the conclusions at which we arrive respecting royalty and its various forms and this is the answer to the question whether it is or is not advantageous to states and to which and how section eighteen we maintain that the true forms of government are three and that the best must be that which is administered by the best and in which there is one man or a whole family or many persons excelling all the others together in virtue and both rulers and subjects are fitted the one to rule the others to be ruled in such a manner as to attain the most eligible life we showed at the commencement of our inquiry that the virtue of the good man is necessarily the same as the virtue of the citizen of the perfect state clearly then in the same manner and by the same means through which a man becomes truly good he will frame a state that is to be ruled by an aristocracy or by a king and the same education and the same habits will be found to make a good man and a man fit to be a statesman or a king having arrived at these conclusions we must proceed to speak of the perfect state and describe how it comes into being and is established end of book three sections fourteen through eighteen